pause because there's something missing that there is. It's a slide that should be there. Um, regional challenges from Timbuktu to Washington, D.C. Snappy title. Um, Obviously, everything we've done to this stage has been looking at individual countries, individual themes, and I thought in the case of regional challenges, of, of um, which there are many, um, we, will take, we will take one example. We'll look at Mali um, and everything that's been going on in Mali. I think it is a very useful case study. And also, in thinking about a case study, rather like your um, essays and policy papers, Having a single case is a useful way of framing your thoughts for this whole semester, now 12 weeks in. And when you come on to do further projects, research projects, think in terms of <coughs> case studies and what goes into them. Um, you need a past, present, and a future. Case studies essentially are telling a story. And you have to know what, what came before. You have to know the situation now before you can offer possible solutions for what comes next. So here we are, introduction. I'm going to stand aside so you can... Can you see that okay? Um, salt comes from the north, gold from the south, but the word of God and the treasures of wisdom come from Timbuktu. This is not um, a contemporary proverb. It's, um, it goes back some 500 years. I think it's rather beautiful in and of itself. Uh, I quite like the themes of the salt, the gold, the wisdom, uh, and the place name Timbuktu, of course, which is... A sort of talisman all on its own. But it's also very interesting to think of salt, gold, wisdom, treasure in terms of Mali today, because it's all there still. Um, Mali is still Africa's largest producer of gold. It's still, I think, the second largest producer of salt. It built its empires in the past on these things, on trading. So when we think of it as, a, as an isolated place, locked away from the world, that suddenly everybody's scrambling around to find that page on the atlas, and how do we get there? We, we should remember that it's not the back, um, back water that we might imagine it to be. It has always been a center of trade, not just for Africa, but north and south across the Sahara, which Great Desert has always operated as a bridge between cultures rather than a barrier between them. So it's sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, across the Mediterranean to Europe and east to um, what we think of as the Middle East and the uh, regions of Central Asia. Timbuktu and what came out of there was central to all of these places, and that's no exaggeration. Um, talking of scrambling around on maps, there it is. I mean, it looks out of the way from a European perspective, perhaps, but um, perspective is everything. You can't have too much of it, apparently. Um, right? So there we are. I hope you all know where it is. Uh, Timbuktu. The spellings vary. Let's not worry about them. Uh, what are we talking about? It's always a nice opening, isn't it? When we look at Mali, when we look at this case study and regional security issues. Um, I think what we need to do when considering Mali is separate legends from reality. So just about every policy paper you will have read pre-2012 would say Mali, model democracy. Now, people were aware there were problems. Um, at least one former <coughs> American ambassador uh, said, you know, we should be watching this country. Things are not all well there. But they had elections. So you have four elections without much violence, and people say, well, that's pretty good. Things are going along as they should be in this model democracy. The fact that the turnouts for those elections were 30% or, or less the lowest turnout for any election in the Sahel or North Africa. I mean, so there are corrupt elections in North Africa and the Sahel, but even so, the situation was so obviously bad for the Malians that people didn't bother going to the polls. That should tell us something. It's not the holding of an election per se, but results, numbers participating. Um, this is what the colours, for the colour spotters among us, the green, uh, yellow, or gold, and red stand for, according to the uh, Malian government. Green, fertility of the land. Um, ironic, really, when you consider that it's been suffering such severe droughts through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and O's. Do we call them the O's? The orts? The orts and the ought nots? Anyway, the 2000s. Um, uh, there have been periodic droughts in Mali which um, have been devastating. Not just Mali, of course, but across the whole Sahelian region. Gold, um, 
purity, i.e. purity of gold, and mineral wealth. As I say, Mali has plenty of this still, nothing like perhaps it once did. But there is enough there still to generate some income in the country. And red, bloodshed for independence, a uh, very popular one. And pan-African colours. Sometimes you see one of these um, changed out for black instead of the gold. Um, interestingly, the, the black as a pan-African colour was introduced by Marcus Garvey, the American, um, African-American. And it's not a native choice of colour in Africa. But that's just an aside. Um, and talking about spellings of Timbuktu, I, I've, I've always been rather fond of this list by uh, the, the English writer Bruce Chatwin, writing in uh, Vogue magazine in 1970. So you see, all the great writers turn to Vogue at some time or another. So Timbuktu, Tumbutu, Tumbuktu, 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 or Tembuk. It doesn't matter how you spell it. The word is a slogan, a ritual formula, once heard, never forgotten. Now, I've not asked this before of um, Americans, a group of Americans, but does it have a resonance with you? When you, when you first remember hearing the word Timbuktu, does, what does it make you think of? Anything? Nothing? Was, was it always a word you were aware of? Yeah. Yeah. Exotic. Exotic? Yeah. Beyond the edge of nowhere. Beyond the edge of nowhere, right. And, and, but was this common in your growing up when you were children? No. Timbuktu was... Yeah, from here to Timbuktu. From here to Timbuktu, it's like the dark side of the moon, virtually. It can make you think of the old Bob Hope road movies and stuff. Was there a road to Timbuktu? I think it was. Was there? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Go back and, and search that out. So, yeah, certainly, I, I'm just checking because I know that for me growing up in England, it was very much that remoter than remote place. But as I pointed out earlier, it has not always been the case. This character, if you don't remember him from week one, when we did the introduction to the Sahara, I'm sure you do all remember, don't you? Think back 11 weeks, jolly good. Uh, I don't have to dwell on his story then, but Mansa Musa, uh, one of the most important characters in, in the world in this period, no question about it. The world's richest man of any time period. And if you doubt my word for that, um, Forbes magazine came up with a list of richest people in the world last December, I think, or January this year. Um, and sure enough, they put Mansa Musa number one of all time richest people. They said, you know, it makes the, 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 the you know, Bob Gates and, and so on look like they're scraping around for change on the floor. The money that he had was so much. When he went to Cairo, he spent so freely on his Hajj that the price of gold across the Middle East was deflated for more than a dozen years. Um, quite incredible. Uh, so, as I say, there's a little less gold in the country than there was 500 years, 600 years ago. But still, it's an important resource for the country. And there he is, so remote in the middle of the Sahara, that even 500 years later, Europeans were flocking to try and find Timbuktu because of the legend of Mansa Musa and his gold. So his bequest, I wonder, was it a strong economy? Well, certainly not for the greater Middle East, um, but at home it certainly did found gold and salt, founded an empire that lasted long after Mansa Musa's death. Strong economy, just bear it in mind for later, for our case study. French West Africa, one block of land. When the French started prospecting and taking over bits of North Africa, the desert, um, the British were asked for their, their view on this, obviously. This, this sort of thousand years of annoying each other relationship between the English and the French was, uh, was alive and well in the 19th century and long into the 20th. And the British Prime Minister let, said, let the Gallic cock scratch in the sand. Um, and this is, what they, this is what the British didn't want, the Sahara. Uh, what do we see when we look at this map? Any observations, thoughts? Not, I'm not looking for one answer. I just want, yeah, please. It, my eye goes kind of towards the, it goes towards the coast. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Do you think? Um, the rivers. Run. Right, rivers. You get you mine mineral, minerals in the center, and then you have a lot of you have a lot of ports that you can go to. That mm -hmm. also looks like there are ports that no one else would probably really fight over. They're a bit out of the way from the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, Rio de Oro, of course, 
long to Spain. That's uh, for those of you who've been looking at Western Sahara. That's 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 up this way now. Um, but the first ever bestseller in American history. Um, just tra travails was it called? Travails in Africa. It was set in this area. An American sea captain whose ship ran ashore was taken by Arab um, slave traders. There's a story about this. It, it, it's interesting that even in 1936, you can see that there are places, I know you know this map pretty well uh, today, there are places that do, do not feature on this map. I mean, the French were very good at understanding their African empire. Um, for those of you who saw um, Michael Shurkin talking on the Mali panel a few weeks ago, he was explaining that, that the French managed to uh, pacify, to control Mali, uh, initially at least, with fewer than 100 people, because a number of those people were anthropologists who'd spent time in the country, had the local languages, and made alliances with those who they picked as winners. Now, I'm not saying it's a perfect system or it was the right way to, to do things, but it worked for the French insofar as they let the locals do most of the fighting and controlling on their behalf. And they were only able to do this because of an extensive uh, body of knowledge about what life was really like on the ground. Something that sadly I think um, any number of policymakers fail to do today before we go into foreign parts. So the French bequest, a secure state? Uh, it's questionable. But we must have this in mind again when we consider regional problems. The strong economy, it's an important question across the region and a secure state. I mean, what makes a secure state? Would anybody like to throw out a suggestion? No? I thought you had an idea. When the government has control over the over, yeah. Yeah, a degree, a degree at least of government control would, would be a good thing, for sure. Um, I mean, of course, then we run into the difficulty of strong men, the strong states, where, where it's a police state or a military state where um, you know, we don't have good governance. But security is a good starting point, I think. And I'm not promoting strong men politics, but you understand that you do need a degree of security for anybody to get on with anything. If you don't feel secure about leaving your house, you're not going to go to the market. If you don't feel secure with the legal system in your country, you're not going to start a business. Everything's going to be under the radar. There's no taxation coming to central government. As uh, Chinua Achebe said, things fall apart. You know, this is happening in, in country after country, not just in Africa, of course, but throughout history. Um, it's just another factor to bear in mind. Um, oh, good. My corrections to this held out. It's not quite as centered as it was in the original. But um, interesting to note the ethnic uh, groups in Mali. Uh, percentages in the left-hand column then the name of the um, ethnic group in the middle column, and then uh, an estimation of their total numbers in the country. Did that all work? Yeah. Um, I think because so much of the story of Mali today is dominated, at least in the popular press, by talk of the Tuareg, the blue men, these kind of figures of legend and mystery, it's worth noting that in Mali they make up about 8% of the population. Other estimates say 6, some say 10. It's not... It's not a majority. I don't think you have to point that out for the non-mathematicians in the room. Um, you know, maybe one million, maybe far fewer. And yet, as I say, when we read the popular press about what's happening in Mali today, you might think that the Tuareg were a majority. They're not even a majority in the north of the country. There are Tuareg majority areas within uh, the provinces of Kidal, Gao, and Timbuktu. But in no sense do they you know, completely dominate these areas that um, those sections of their society, the MNLA in particular, uh, who are demanding autonomy, they don't have a majority voice. The post-colonial rulers bequest, honest representative government, where all people are represented equally and have a fair share of life in their country. Yes, of course, I'm being ironic. A successful state, then. This is Mali, as we, as we have it on the map today. If it was doing so well since 1991, how did it fall apart so very easily in 2012? If you've got such a very successful state, ask yourself the question, why would anybody want to stage a military coup? 
just you know, have these questions in mind when you think about military coups and people tell you that we didn't see it coming. We had no idea that things were, were rotten in the country. Um, and equally, going back to the ethnic, uh, ethnic differences question, try not to lump people together. Um, some, I can't remember who it was, said that historians tend to fall into two groups, the lumpers and the splitters. You know, the historians want to put everything into one box or break it down to as many as possible. I think it's a bit of both. You know, we, we have to be nuanced, and every set of circumstances is different. And here's our remote Timbuktu, of course. Timbuktu province here, running up and on the Algerian border, Kidal and Gao. This is essentially these three provinces, which the, the southern borders of which follow the Niger River, was the bits that were uh, taken over so easily and so successfully. Uh, and for such a brief period of time last year and into this. So going back to our Mali today, we, we've looked at the past, we've looked at the establishment of the country, where it came from, and um, what the various um, bequests it received were. So what about the country now? Um, I did like this line from uh, Michael Shurkin's presentation of a few weeks ago, that Mali, he said, exists in a permanent state of crisis, um, and, and pretty much has done, he was arguing, for, let's say, 30 years. Um, the various crises are not all um, human, uh, by human design or fault. Um, I mentioned the droughts earlier. These are important, but there are others. It's true, as we saw, there are ethnic differences and religious divides, although when you think about how many different ethnic groups there are, um, the religious differences are much, much fewer. About 90% of the population are Muslim, uh, 90%, 5% are Christian, and 5% follow indigenous animist religions. Um, again, if you look up the, the kind of sweeping one-sentence overview of, of uh, Islam in Mali, they'll say, tends to be Sufi, tends to be tolerant, tends to be, tends to be. Um, it, it tended to not be so tolerant of late, but again, it doesn't take an awful lot of people to upset a very shaky apple cart. We're back to our stick figure. It's a kanaga, they call it. Kanaga. Um, I think in Bambaro language, if anybody's a Bambaro speaker, you can correct me now. Yeah, I, I dodged a bullet there. Um, <laughs> I don't even know where one goes to study Bambara, although it's spoken by you know, more than 50% of Malians. I don't know there's a single center for it in, in D.C., um, I throw this figure up. It was the Malian flag, just just proper Malian flag. It was an alternate for two years, 1959, 1960. When Mali was federated with um, its neighbours before the French fully left, um, the Kanaga was dropped in 1960, though, because of objections by a small number of Islamists in the country who objected to the representation of living things. Um, I have to say, when I look at the stick figure, I mean, I suppose it is representative, yeah, I, I take the point, but um, I, I find it rather jolly and, and rather a shame that somebody could be so offended as to lose the uh, stick figure from your flag, because uh, for my money, it would be one of the, 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 the most happy flags in the whole world today. But anyway, um, it has disappeared. Um, so again, 1959, 1960, the objections were raised. Uh, questions of, of religious sensitivities in the Sahel and North Africa are not new by any means. Um, so, as I mentioned, the ethnic and religious differences exist, but they are not, and, and never have been, until the past couple of years, perhaps, central to Mali's problems. Um, resource insecurity, now that is a big one. I've mentioned these periodic um, droughts that have taken place. They're ongoing today. Uh, last year, the rains failed to come, so that now, as well as having insurgents in the north and the French army in there and the Chadians and, and the UN promising 11,000 troops coming from goodness knows where to do who knows what, we have the problem of people starving, so the internally displaced and the refugee problem is not limited to the areas where there's a, a war going on, but it's spreading out right across the Sahara. And now I know... What slide is missing? Yes, it was that. The next one that we were going to have was a really good slide which showed internally displaced peoples across the Sahel, but alas. It will be in the um, PowerPoint presentation or the keynote presentation I send out tomorrow. Um, as an aside, while I think of it, I have tended to put keynote presentations um, 
online on the Blackboard system. Has anybody access to them? I want to know if you can, is the question, not, not the frequency. You can open the keynotes, okay, can you? Okay, good. Um, so, as I said, uh, the regions of Timbuktu, Kidal, and Gao, which together is roughly the area that the um, MNLA, that minority of a minority, claim as their state in northern Mali. These dots represent, uh, this is a French map, um, so um, forgive the fact that I've cut the French off at the bottom, it wasn't deliberate. Um, these dots are representative of majority Tuareg areas. <laughs> it's interesting when you think that the total population is a million or less in the country, in a country of 14 and a half, 15 million people, and the attention they get, again today from the French who were in there saying, we can talk to the Tuareg, we're doing deals with the Tuareg, the Tuareg will help us. It's rather unfortunate that the lessons the French had in the 19th century and the 20th century about understanding the human geography are not being carried through into the 21st century. Or are they? What the French have done is made a strategic decision that the Tuareg, who are the the minority of Tuareg, who are the most boisterous and troublesome people in the north of the country, and the most well-armed, are perhaps the agents with whom they can do business. It's much easier than trying to take their guns away or persuading others to uh, accept Tuareg rule. Just let the, deal with the Tuareg directly and let them start controlling the local area. Um, as we know, the French want to get out as soon as possible. Um, they're the only, ones who, uh, the only ones who want them to leave are the French. Everybody else would like to stay much, much longer, but it's not going to be the case. Um, I do love uh, organizations' logos. This one's rather good. It's, um, this is for the MNLA, and uh, the legend along the bottom, uh, Unity, Justice, Freedom, crossed swords here at the top. I think it's one of the rare organizations in the world that's, that's written in uh, French, Arabic, and Tamashek which is nice, doesn't often get a show. Um, and the nice red star at the top takes us back to um, a sort of Cold War logo that, that has disappeared from many places. Um, the MNLA, you know, the red star is indicative of something which is, yes, left-leaning, socialist, but also secular nationalist. And I think this has been very important in the conflict that people say, oh, the MNLA sided with Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb are Islamists, therefore MNLA must be Islamist also. It hasn't been the case. Um, there was a strategic alliance formed between the secular nationalist group and the likes of Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb and Sadin and other Islamist groups. MNLA, as anybody who's read a newspaper knows, came off by far the worst very quickly. Um, but anyway, I thought it's a nice logo to throw up there. I haven't seen it on many patches around DC, but I suppose their numbers are uh, few inside the district capital. It claims 10,000 members. Um, Tuareg population of Mali is about 1 million. Um, let's go back to their logo. This unity, justice, and freedom bit. Uh, you wonder, really, I know all organizations make grand claims for themselves, but if they're trying to claim unity, is it for the 10,000 or for the, the other hundreds of thousands who haven't joined you yet? Uh, justice, uh, yeah, at what cost? And freedom... Freedom for the 10,000, uh, freedom for the 1 million Tuareg, um, even non-party members. Um, dubious claims, I would say, as are many uh, logos, slogans, interesting figures. Um, this man you will have seen quite a bit of recently, Captain Sonogo, uh, who led the military coup last year. Um, can somebody else please... Very quickly, name me a famous captain who led a military coup in North Africa. Gaddafi. Yeah, excellent, Gaddafi. Huh? And there's another one? Dadi Dadi's, yeah. It's funny, isn't it? You get to that middle rank of a captain, or a lower middle rank, I suppose, and they think, oh, my promotions aren't swift enough. i tell you what I'll do. I'll have a coup. Yeah, um, he's a little older than 72. What is he, 40? Uh, Gaddafi was in his late 20s when he launched his coup. Um... Sonogo's claims, of course, were that he was the saviour of the country. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful irony, and if it wasn't for the war that's taken place and the death and the mayhem and the upset and everything else, 
It would be, it was a big rider, by the way, before I say, wouldn't it be amusing to realise that uh, Captain Sonogo said he was launching this coup because the government weren't doing enough to deal with the Tuareg threat in the north. So he launches his coup, and then, boom, uh, the whole of the north is overrun. And, uh, you know, he's forced to say, oh, we need the international community in here to help us. I mean, talk about stirring up a hornet's nest that he was not able to control. I think this is fairly typical, though, isn't it, of coup leaders through history, uh, that they are the only person who can save the country. And as soon as it's possible, we will be handing control back to the civilians. We've seen in Mali that, yes, the, the civilian administration is now there, that uh, Sanogo has appointed a cabinet um, and then dismissed those of them that disagreed with him. Um, we are looking forward with trepidation to an election in Mali in July, which is something that America wants, it's something that France wants, it's something that uh, Britain and the rest of the European, uh, uh, European Union are keen to have. But it's probably the one thing that Mali is not ready for. Um, voter registration before an election in America is a fairly painless process because you have a, a register, a role, which has been in place for years. And of course, um, I think there are always additions to that and people coming off that. There are births and deaths and people move around the country. Um, such a neat system of voter registration does not exist in Mali. Um, that's just one problem. Then, of course, you've got 100,000 people who are internally displaced in the north. Where are they going to vote? Then there's all the people who fled Mali to neighboring countries. Uh, are we setting up polling stations for them? Are we going to police it? How are, we, how are we going to take care of the international observers over there? And if all of these things fail to come to be uh, on the elections for the end of July, what sort of election are we left with? That's a rhetorical question. It's a very bad election is what we're left with. But even so, the international community are pushing this issue so that what? So that they can say once again, look, I had an election in Mali, things are back to normal, we can wash our hands and, and leave again. I'm just suggesting, not too subtly, it's perhaps not a good idea. So, this brings us to part three. Coup plus war equals... It's not a formulation I've had to work out before, so we'll see where it leads us. There's the hero of the day, again, Captain Sonogo. Um, as many of you probably know, the American military have been uh, busy in Mali and other parts of the Sahel over the past decade training African troops. Captain Sonogo was one of the troops trained by America. Does that mean that America should not be training African troops? Or does that mean that some of the troops you train may turn out to be bad apples? And I'm not telling you which way to go on that, but um, I know what I think. Um, and that is that when people claim that we should not have trusted the Tuareg because Sonogo's Tuareg and because the people we trained led a coup, I think it's nonsense. It's... Um, well, it's poppycock, isn't it, frankly? Um, they're not representative of the country. They're not representative even of their own tribe. So why we would assume that any attempts to train people from ethnic group A or B must inherently be flawed, um, is, there's no logic to it. So this, if you... Let me turn this light off for a second. Um, this rather, uh, these rather cheerful colours show the conflict as of January. So this situation has changed enormously, of course, since the French intervention has been more successful. MNLA in the north, contested areas, Kedal. This is still contested today. Um, can you see... Uh, where's the purple? I can't see the purple. I was going to say Mujwa, anyway, more active over here in Gao. Now, the, the complicating thing about what's been happening in um, Mali is that people assume that the MNLA were the single force, the representatives, the armed representatives of the uh, move for autonomy. It's not necessarily true. The MNLA were, let's say, the most active group 
before the introduction of um, Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb, before Ansar al-Din, before Mujwa. But each of these three radical Islamist groups have come in and have split MNLA into factions without any difficulty whatsoever. Because MNLA didn't spring from nowhere. All of the leaders of this movement have been in Mali for decades. They have been constantly forging and breaking alliances. And they're not doing it for the good of the movement. They're not doing it for their cause. They're doing it for much more quotidian reasons. Generally because there are individuals who don't get on with each other. Um, and now I've mentioned this before, and I'm, I'm not afraid to say it again. Always be aware of the human factor in any of these, these conflicts. When you look at the names and faces of those leading the groups, you understand that each one of these people has a very long history. Sometimes they're friends with the guy they're, they're fighting with. The next day they formed a splinter group, as we will see. Mokhtar bel Mokhtar. Great name, isn't it? Mokhtar bel Mokhtar. Also known as Marlborough Man. Um, not because he was a heavy smoker, but because he was heavily into smuggling cigarettes. Um, also known as uh, the One-Eyed. His left eye is absent. He lost it in an accident in Afghanistan. Um, also known as the Uncatchable. He has been a thorn in the side of local politics for some years. Um, there's a question mark here. The Chadian army claimed that they have killed him, but there has been no evidence provided for this so far. Um, thus, we must treat such a claim with caution. Um, the black flag for Al-Qaeda. Mokhtar bel Mokhtar. Talk about somebody with a personal history. Um, there's a lot of text here, but then he's been in a lot of groups. Um, some of you have done papers on Mali, so I might invite you to come up here and, and give the detail to the rest of the class. But it's worth noting that, as I say, uh, allegiances are not fixed. They're certainly not fixed in Algeria. They're not fixed anymore in Mali. So GSPC we've looked at before. GIA, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, the most recent incarnation. He fell out with the leaders of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and went on to found the Masked Brigade, also known as... Um, and again, if it wasn't so serious and they weren't so murderous, it would be amusing. Those who signed their names in blood. I mean, really, it sounds like a sort of teenage gangs uh, rather than any credible threat to national security. But they are a threat to Malian security. Um, it was these people who were responsible for the Inaminus attack in Algeria, many, many miles beyond the borders of Mali. Um, but really, when I read names that those who sign their names in blood, I, I can't take them seriously. I suppose we should. Um, Abu Musab al Wadud, who sadly doesn't have any um, wonderful uh, nom de guerre. He stuck with just Abu Malik Druhdel. Uh, Marlborough Man was taken. Um, so this was the leader of Al Qaeda in the Maghreb, and it was with this man that uh, Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar had the falling out to form those who signed their names in blood. Um, there were rumours again that he was killed recently, but um, I think we can scotch those. With Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, we're far less certain, but I, I, we've got good evidence that this chap is still very much alive and kicking. Um, and as closely connected to Al-Qaeda Central as anybody in the Sahel is. And let's not forget Mujwa, which again, uh, an acronym that doesn't translate terribly well into English. It doesn't have the sort of the sort of good ring that so many uh, groups would like. The Movement for Unity and Jihad in West Africa. Another AQIM split. Um, somewhat different, though, in their, in their goals. I mean, Malians and Mauritanians. If you look at film put out by the various groups, um, terrorist groups, Islamist groups working in the region, you will see those that have a lot more black faces and those that have a lot more Arab faces. It's indicative often of which bit of the country or which bit of the region they come from. And again, when we're thinking in terms of human geography and how to assess something, it's worth knowing somebody's lineage, what tribe they come from, because the tribes at this level are very important. Um, yes, they did manage very briefly to establish a Taliban-like regime in Gao, which involved stoning people, uh, amputations, and an occasional beheading. They're, they're um, not terribly nice people. Um, for all of their claims to religious authenticity, of course, they make their money from smuggling. 
and kidnappings. So um, acts of criminality uh, condemned widely in the Islamic world, as I'm sure you're aware. But anyway, um, as my grandmother would say, the devil himself can quote scripture for his own purposes. And these people certainly do that. Criminality will, I think, always triumph ideology. Um, without money, these groups can't operate, so they resort to the kidnapping of uh, typically foreigners. If you, if you grab a Frenchman or a Spaniard, you're going to get a lot more money potentially out of the government, or at least the family, than you will for kidnapping a Malian who, you know, frankly, you could kill and, and nobody might miss them apart from their immediate family. So um, I just see today more kidnappings in the region. Uh, it's ongoing and it's very um, dangerous for people to be on the ground there right now. I suppose that goes without saying. Um, books about counterterrorism are numerous and very fat, some of them, and some of them are very thin. This is not meant to be conclusive, but there are three very strong objectives to many, I say many, counterterrorism operations. One is a nullification of the enemy. That you do by killing them, by capturing them, or by otherwise depriving them of the ability to operate freely. The second thing is the denial of a safe haven. If you have no base on the ground, it's very difficult to organize, to plot, to plan, to train, and to move on to launch attacks. One and two have been achieved fairly easily. They are the easiest things to achieve in this um, three-legged um, strategy. The French have gone in and they've disrupted. They've killed people, they've captured some people, people have moved on, they've denied them safe haven. Element the third and last and most difficult is the one that people generally fall down on before they um, try and push it through. They, nobody has yet addressed local conditions. And by that I mean we're still going to force through an election in July without doing a proper count of who's eligible to vote. We're saying that we've denied them safe haven so we can leave. So when we, that is the Western troops, leave, you can be sure they, the, the bad guys that we've just dispersed, will come back again. Um, this, as I say, is always the most difficult thing to achieve because it takes time and money. Of course, by not doing it, it can cost you a great deal more money down the line. But sadly, as I've mentioned before, um, Democratic countries in the West find it very difficult to have strategic plans that are 10, 20, 30, or 40 years in length, generally because elections are held every two or four years. <clears throat> so there they are, the French on the ground. Um, I would have to say that I, I was very impressed with the French action. I was very impressed with the speed with which they went in. I don't think, um, and we'll never know, but I don't think that those forces in the north posed any real threat to the government in Bamako, that is, to the coup leaders, to the capital itself. I don't think they were going to try and take Bamako and take over the whole of Mali. I don't believe that was their intention. That said, um, I don't think we could have stood by, particularly, without something being taken for the northern half, northern two-thirds of the country, uh, and in that respect, I think the French did a very quick job very quickly. Phase one, phase two. Um, these are French jets, by the way, for any plane spotters. Uh, the, the Mirage. Any, any plane spotters? No, they're very fast. And they're very dangerous if you're on the wrong end of them. Um, they're faster than drones. Um, this is something which America can provide and is offering to provide, is air support. Not necessarily in fighter terms, but in transport and so on and so forth. They're going to need a lot of it, um, the Malians, particularly if the, the French pull out. But this is, not, this is not an effective way to police what's happening down here um, in the desert. I don't think I need to labour the point. But it's very easy for us to say, well, let's throw some planes over there and we'll do a bit of monitoring from the sky and hope everything stays fairly passive on the ground. That's not a solution. It's not even a, a sticking plaster on a cut. It does little, if nothing, to help the people on the ground regain any sense of security, which, going back to the very beginning of this lecture, is what I believe people need most of all. That and the secure, uh, secure, security and a sound economy. 
And the Arab Spring. Where does the Arab Spring fit into the problems of northern Mali today? Well, it's not nearly as important as you might think. Um, again, the popular press will talk about the number of weapons which have gone missing from Libya and have spread out across the region. Well, for anybody who knows West Africa at all, there's always been a fair few weapons in the region. Um, what the addition of weapons to the market have done is perhaps brought down the per unit price of a Kalashnikov, but there was never any difficulty with people having weapons in that part of the world, trust me. Um, it did release people that were in service in Libya, and there were Malians who were fighting um, against the Gaddafi regime. But when I say Malians, I should correct myself and say there were Tuareg who don't recognize themselves as Malians. There were, there were Tuareg who still range across national borders without regard for those same internationally recognized borders. There were Tuareg who fought, fought on both sides of the war in Libya. So again, it wasn't all one or the other. Um, I think the Arab Spring has confused the situation slightly, muddied the waters, to use that, uh, that uh, rather dark expression. But it hasn't been central to what's happened in Mali. It was not a major trigger. A conclusion. I see you breathing a sigh of relief. A strong economy, a secure state, and representative, honest governance. Three things I hope I've argued that have not been present in Mali for some time. The Arab Spring comes after all of these, and as I say, with decades of corruption in government, um, with allegations of the government being involved in the smuggling operations. I forgot to mention that earlier, um, and it's as true today for uh, our saviour of the country, Captain Sonogo. Uh, there are allegations that the government have been involved in the smuggling as much as the Tuareg and other groups in the north, which is why there is such a conflict, because the drugs trade and cigarette trade is so very profitable. Um, this flag we haven't seen for a while, the Arab Maghreb Union. Um, I put it up not because I believe that the Arab Maghreb Union is the solution, but I think the idea of some sort of economic cooperation, security cooperation among countries of the region is central. I mean, it may not be this flag, but it has to involve all of those countries. The Arab Maghreb Union exists, I think, as a model failure since 1989 of how things just will not work without that sort of cooperation. So, this is the conclusion part two. This is the words. No, sorry, you thought you were done. No. Um, in the words of the former... Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, all politics is local. It's as true in Mali uh, as it is in, in America. You know, people have local concerns, and they care about the local concerns much more, one will find, typically, than they do at national level politics. Now, of course, this changes in, uh, for presidential elections, perhaps. But by and large, I think it's not a bad jumping off point to consider all politics as local. And so, too, must any genuine solutions... It's no good the French or the British or anybody else for that matter coming into Mali and saying, hey, we've got a perfect solution for you. We tried this in Brittany and it was just, it was a winner. You know, we're just going to drop this constitution on you or we're going to drop this aid package on you. It's, it's, it's going to work, trust me. And if it doesn't, then, you know, maybe we need to send in some more troops to make sure it does work. Um, not that that's happened in Mali. And regional concerns, very important, require region-wide solutions which need more cooperation than is present today. Um, I suppose the second half of that sentence is um, a terrible example in stating the bleeding obvious. There is no regional cooperation today, um, not just between Algeria and Morocco and that shut border, but between Algeria and anybody in the region. Although, interestingly, I see that um, Algeria's ties to the West are a lot closer now since in Amina's gas plant attack. So we will see where that leads us. But I think with those two points in mind, um, and the three ideas of the security, economy, and honest governance, you are now ready to take on any problems that might exist across our region of interest. <laughs>